I want to say good morning to all our family and friends at Sunbird Community Church. It's a joy to be able to be with you this morning, even though it's via video and the internet. But again, I'm very thankful to be with you in the uncertain days in which we live. Uh, this morning, I want to bring truth from Romans chapter 8, and the title is Certain Truths for Uncertain Times. But before we get into the word, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for every person viewing this video, and I pray, God, for all my dear family and friends at Sunbird Community. I pray that you'd protect them and give them peace and direction and strength. And Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, please teach us your word today. Please also encourage hearts that are hurting, anxious, fearful, um, those that are ready to get going and get out and do the things that we were created to do. Father, we pray that you give us patience as we wait for uh, the right time to do what you've called us to do, Father. Help us to draw close to you during these times of isolation and, and specific protecting ourselves uh, from this, uh, the threat of this virus. And just, Lord, today, give us certainty that you have everything that we need in the days ahead. Thank you, Lord for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is a time of uncertainty. You, you don't know if you go to Fry's Food Store to get your antibacterial soap, whether there'll be antibacterial soap there, uh, because people have hoarded it. They've bought, you know, enough antibacterial soap for the next five years for themselves. Logic would call us to uh, question those actions, because they have to realize that if they buy all the antibacterial soap, then how are the rest of us going to wash our hands? And is it not needed uh, to fight this virus that all of our hands are washed? So anyways, uh, yeah, the days in which we live are uncertain. We're uncertain about our finances. We're uncertain about the future of our country as we take on trillions of dollars of debt. We're uncertain about our health, and we're uncertain about the future of this virus. Where does it go? How long does it last? Will the summer kill it? Um, I'm hoping so, and I'm hoping to um, be active and out of isolation very soon. And I know that many of you are too. I mean, it's, it's one of the difficult times in which we live, a time of uncertainty. Uh, perhaps you're uncertain about your family's health, and I know I am too. I've been praying for my children and my grandchildren during these times. We do live in a time of great uncertainty, but I believe the passage that we're going to look at this morning in Romans chapter 8 will provide four certain truths for the uncertain times in which we live. If you take your Bibles and open them to Romans chapter 8 verses 31 through 39, I'd like to read them with you. Paul says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In this passage, Paul is speaking to believers in Rome who definitely are under persecution, discouragement, and some even feel defeated. Uh, they are being tried in their faith. And after developing God's teaching on our salvation in chapters 1 through 7, Paul then brings us to chapter 8 
to share with us the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And in verse 31 of chapter 8, Paul lays the foundations for the things we can be certain of by sharing these incredible truths that are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The first truth is this. We can, in these uncertain times, be certain of God's care for us. Verses 31 and 32, Paul says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with Christ, with him, graciously give us everything we need? We can be certain of God's care for us, regardless of our circumstances, the balance in our bank accounts, the way we feel, the sickness we're struggling with, the worries that weary us, or the anxiety that may be captivating us, God is for us. God is for you. God is, quote unquote, on our side because we're on his side in Christ. And how powerful is this God who is for us? Job describes him like this in Job 34, verse 4, where he says, He is the one who laid the foundations of the earth, the one who set out its measurements, who framed the universe and set it in space. That same God is for us. That same God is for you. I know there are some people who say, Hey, why don't you prove that God is for us? I'm not really sure he's for me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm going through. And if God is for me, I'd sure hate to see what it's like if he's against me because my life is a mess. God has an answer for those struggles because he proves for us in verse 32 that God is, in fact, for us us. He loves us. Remember John 3, 16? For God so what? Loved the world. And verse 32 of Romans chapter 8, Paul says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That passage states that God proves he is for us by giving us the very best when he gave us his son, Jesus. Think about it. If, while we were still sinners, separated from God, enemies of God, and God at that point, at that point gave us his very best, proves that we can be certain of his care for us because he gave his son to save us. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11? He said this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Actually, it's in the present tense. Keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek, keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock, keep on knocking, and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who keeps asking will receive, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be open to him. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a serpent? In other words, we have a good father. Or if he asks for a fish, oh, excuse me, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. I mean, if my kids came to me and said, Daddy, I'm hungry. I'd like a peanut butter sandwich. I wouldn't give them uh, a scorpion, right? Because I love them. And if, if, if I, who know evil, and I'm not God, and I don't have the righteousness uh, in my flesh that God has, he's perfect. If, if I know about evil, and yet I know how to give good gifts to my children, how much more will our Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? That's what Jesus said. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. And I am of the firm conviction that when we come to God in prayer, knowing with confidence that he is not only in us, he is with us, and he is for us, God will provide. 
And if God does not provide what we ask, it's only for one of two reasons, or maybe both reasons. Number one, God will provide for us what we really need in another way. I've asked this question before. Aren't you glad that you don't have everything you've asked God for? I am. Or he will protect us from what we think we need. God is good all the time. He is too good to do anything that is evil. And there is wonderful freedom resting in the fact that God is for us. And when God is for us, we can be certain of his care in an uncertain world. That doesn't mean that we're delivered from pain or suffering. I want to talk a little bit about that in the next few verses. But we can be certain that God cares for us. Number two, we can be certain that God will not condemn us. The first part of Romans chapter 8, verse 1, reminds us of that truth. There is therefore now no, what? Condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. The Holy Spirit never condemns the Christian. He convicts us. And if you live under this constant state of condemnation, I'm not this, I'm not that, God could never love me, that's not God. That's the old flesh telling you, if you know Christ, uh, and telling you a lie. God tells you this, there's no, there is no condemnation for you if you're in Christ. And that's further explained in verse 33 and 34. Remember, let's read it again. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. That's a beautiful passage. The Bible clearly states in Romans chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, and now in chapter 8, that Jesus Christ took all of our condemnation of sin and he nailed it to the cross. I love that song. My sin, oh, the joy of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. When Jesus took our condemnation, he replaced our death sentence with his righteousness given to us as a gift. The Lord Jesus himself represents us before the court of heaven. That's what the Bible says here. When the enemy comes to accuse us before the Father, Jesus Christ himself represents us as our lawyer. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 tells me, My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin, but if anyone sins... We have an advocate. The word literally there is lawyer before the Father. And what's his name? Jesus Christ the righteous. Isn't that incredible? When Satan comes to condemn you, to charge you, to malign you of the guilt of your sins, you have Jesus Christ to defend you. Somebody once said, when Satan comes knocking on your door, uh, condemning you, go send Jesus, ask Jesus to answer the door. And when the door is open, the enemy will be gone. When you call out to Christ, he comes in your place before the Father and affirms the fact that he has already paid the debt of sin that you are being accused of. But it's not only that Jesus sits as your lawyer, he also sits as your jury and judge in this heavenly courtroom, uh, explanation in this heavenly courtroom, as uh, verse 34 tells us. Again, one more time, who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. The Lord Jesus is both judge, jury, and lawyer for us. And if our lawyer claims us not guilty, and our lawyer is also our judge and the jury, that sounds like a pretty open, shut case, doesn't it? Satan in our own flesh will fill us with an overpowering despondency of failure by rehashing, rehearsing the sins of the past, the failures of the past. But God is the one who justifies us righteous through Christ, and no one can reopen the case against us. We need never fear a retrial or a contrary verdict. That's pretty awesome. Of this I am sure. 
the resurrection of Jesus and the guarantee to all of us who put our faith in him is forgiveness and freedom from condemnation. And in the heat of spiritual battles we are in, when you feel weak, when your courage is drawn, your enthusiasm is bruised, if not crushed, remember the end of verse 34. It tells us that Jesus intercedes for us. Really, he's also praying for us. Isn't that wonderful? Think about that for a moment. If you have a prayer partner, and I do, I'm just so thankful. In fact, I have someone praying for me right now as I'm doing this message. But I have someone who's a prayer partner forever, and his name is the Lord Jesus. At the end of verse 34, it states that he is at the right hand of God in the position of authority and, and praying for us. It's great to spend time in prayer for others. But remember this, we have a prayer partner whose name is Jesus, who is in fact praying for you and me this morning. Hebrews 7.25 says, he lives forever to make intercession for us. Robert Murray McShane once wrote these words, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. How does that make you feel to hear the truth that Jesus is praying for you and for me? Men and women, in this world of uncertainty, you can be certain of this fact, that God cares for you and that God will not condemn you. In fact, Jesus is interceding and praying for you right now. The third thing that we can be certain of in this passage is that nothing will ever separate us from God's love. Look at verse 35 and 39. Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, verse 36, For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. And I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In these verses, Paul asks the ultimate question. It's as if Paul has an audience of amazed people before him who are listening to these truths of what they have in Christ and the certainties they have in an uncertain world, these promises that God has made. And one of Paul's students asks this question, and we've asked it before, haven't we? Is there anything out there that can ever separate us from the incredible love you're talking about, Paul? You told us we can be certain of these incredible truths, but is there anyone out there, is there anything I could do that would destroy this hope and these certainties that anchor my soul? Is there anyone, is there any way that you can be separated from Christ once you come to him in saving faith? And Paul replies, that's a good question. Let's consider some of the things that could separate us from Christ. How about trials and suffering? How about those times in your life when you feel overwhelmed, when all the world seems dark in the middle of all that's listed in verse 35? Does God still love me? The word tribulation here literally means pressure. God, when I'm under intense pressure, do you still love me? Some of you are under intense pressure. How about distress? How about persecution? How about famine? How about nakedness? How about peril? How about sword? Can you imagine how desperate we would feel if we were undergoing all that Paul had listed here? We're undergoing a coronavirus problem. But I want to remind all of us that this world is not our home. I am just a passing through, and this world is not friendly to followers of Jesus. I am promised, and we are all promised, trials and struggles and difficulties. Jesus told us in Matthew 10, 34, do not think I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And believers around the world characteristically suffer persecution and problems because of their faith in Christ. You and I may be going through, or your family may be going through, one of the most difficult times they've ever gone through, 
with the reality and the result of this pandemic path we've been walking together over the last eight weeks. Does this time separate us from God's love? Absolutely not. God still loves us. He cares for us. It's constant. But he does call for us to come to him as a child would in complete and trusting faith when we feel overwhelmed. As the psalmist writes, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I am. I want to come to my father when I feel frightened. And I tell you, there's been times, men and women, I've felt frightened during this time of pandemic. I feel, felt frightened for my grandchildren. I felt frightened for my kids who work in a charter school caring for a lot of uh, Native American, dear, sweet Native American people who are have been very susceptible to this virus. I said, oh God, please protect my kids. But as we live in this uncertain world, I want to give you one more final certainty. We can be certain of God's power in us to overcome our pain. Paul ends this passage by telling us that in all the difficulties we go through as disciples of Jesus, we can overwhelmingly conquer through God's power in us and through us. In Greek, the word conquer in verse 37, in all these things we are more than conquerors. That word literally means super conqueror. I, my mind immediately goes to superhero, <clears throat> but that's what God calls us. He calls us we're super conquerors. We're, we're overcomers in Christ. Why is a true believer a super conqueror in the middle of trials and testings? Well, a super conqueror knows where his power comes from. And trials draw us closer to Christ instead of driving us away from us, away from him. I think of godly brothers and sisters who've been given the ultimate test of persecution, difficulty, trial, and tribulation. I get emails from them around the world today about the struggles they're undergoing, all because they're committed to follow Christ no matter the cost. It was Polycarp, an 86-year-old pastor of the church in Smyrna, which is presently Turkey, uh, who earlier had been a friend and had been mentored by the Apostle John himself. When Polycarp was 86 years old, he was arrested and commanded to renounce Christ before a judge, jury, and a gawking crowd. Polycarp said, I am 86 years old. And I have served Christ all my life, and he has never done me any injury. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? The judge said, I have respect for your age, sir. Simply say, away with the atheists. Now, Christians were called atheists by the Roman leadership because they re rejected the Roman gods and they rejected Caesar as God as well. In response, Polycarp looked at the crowd, looked at the judge, and pointed at them and said, away with the atheists. And he was pointing right at the people and right at the judge. I have no God. I have no Lord, but Jesus Christ, my Messiah. And I will not recount my faith in him. Because of that proclamation, Polycarp joyfully went to the stake, thanking God that he was counted ready to die for his Savior and King Jesus, 86 years old, and his story has impacted my life today. Ray Steadman writes, trials make us cling harder. They scare us and make us run to Christ. It's in our prideful independence when we think we can do it on our own that often these trials strike and the true believer runs for home. One of the great verifiers of our faith in Christ is how we respond to trials. I quote again Ray Steadman in his commentary on the book of Romans. He says, nothing can separate me from God's measureless love. Pain can't, disappointment can't, anguish can't, yesterday, today, tomorrow can't separate me from God's love. 
The loss of my dearest loved one can't separate me from the love of God. I know many of you have lost dear loved ones. God's love for you is constant and certain. Death can't separate us from God's love. Life can't. Riots, war, hunger, neurosis, disease, none of these, nor all of them heaped together can budge the fact that I am dearly loved, completely forgiven, and forever free from condemnation through Jesus Christ my Lord. My dear brothers and sisters at Sunbird, though we may fall flat on our face, we may be fear-filled and beaten down, God's love for us and his message for us this morning is changeless. There is no turn of affairs of a fractured life that God's love cannot heal the fractures. It's certain. He's for us. He loves us. He cares for us. And he cares for you. What about you this morning as I close? Are you certain of these truths that God has promised in your life personally? I just have one question. Are you certain in your faith? Is your heart secure with the certain promises of God? No matter what comes our way, no matter the problems, no matter the trials, we are certain of the fact that God's love for us is always there, that his power is constantly provided, and that his care for us never fails. My heart and my hope is that each one of us have this deep love for Jesus and trust his plan in our lives. The circumstances around us are uncertain, but God is above circumstances. God's grace and power are not circumstantial. They are eternal and ever available for each one of us when we call on his name. Do you have the assurance and certainty of a living relationship with God through faith in Christ? Do you know that you are loved by him, forgiven by him, and he's willing to empower you? Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every dear brother and sister at Sunbird. I pray for those watching who hearts are filled with uncertainty this morning that you'd fill their heart with the powerful certain truths of Romans chapter 8 verses 31 through 39. Of this I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come will ever be able to separate us from the love that you have for us in Christ Jesus. Lord, right now, I pray you'd wrap your love around every person watching and let them know you, are, you will never leave them alone, that you care for them, and that care and love is constant. And if you're listening this morning and say, I, I, I don't know what it means to know Jesus, all you need to do is say, Lord Jesus, I've sinned against you. That's for sure. But I believe in, in my heart that you died for me on the cross I believe you were buried. I believe you rose again to pay the penalty for my sin. And I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. If you make that commitment to him this morning, the certain truths that I've talked about are yours for certain. May God bless you, Sunbird. And I hope to see you soon. God bless.